Now to the fallout from the extraordinary performance on last night's show by Liberal MP Gladys Liu over her ties to the communist Chinese regime and a refusal to criticise China. Now the full video you can see on my blog, but here are some highlights before we tell you what happened today, including that late-breaking news I mentioned earlier about an ASIO investigation. Now I asked the Liu about the fact that she'd been listed for 12 years in China as a member of the China Overseas Guangdong Exchange Association, an organisation that's now part of China's United Front Work Department. It's propaganda arm. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I cannot recall uh, if, as it reported, that uh, from 2003 to 2015, 12 years long, uh, that if I can't recall, I can't be an active member of that uh, council, can I? How can you not recall a membership of 12 years? I mean, we've just shown your name listed there. I've got another document I can show you of your name listed in the other association. That's two associations, association lasting 12 years, and you can't recall it? Well, I can tell you that I have never been a member of this council, and, um, yeah, it can happen. Uh, they can put your name there without your knowledge. So first, she couldn't remember, and then did she suddenly mid-interview, did remember that she wasn't a member, wasn't a member. And she couldn't remember being a member of this one either. Have a listen. You were also, uh, from you, you were also honorary president of the United Chinese Commerce Association. Now, there is evidence that this too is connected to the United Front. Uh, true or not? Um, what is that organisation again? I don't think I am. But when the dim sum hit the fan overnight, well, Lou had to rethink all those positions, those false claims, and issued a statement today in which she admitted she had indeed been with both those groups, plus one other, despite what she told me last night. Now, she said, I can confirm my previous association with the following community groups. Honorary President of the United Chinese Commerce Association of Australia, Honorary President of the Australian Jiangmen General Commercial Association and Honorary Role of the Guangdong Overseas Exchange Association in 2011. Well, it wasn't just in 2011, it was for, as we said, a dozen years. But she says she's no longer a member of such groups. But that wasn't all that Gladys Liu got badly wrong last night. She refused also to criticise China's dictator, Premier Xi Jinping, President, saying that he'd actually been elected under China's system. What a joke. And she wouldn't say what her own government does say, that China's theft of the South China Sea is, in fact, unlawful under international law. The Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague has said that China uh, taking over the South China Sea was unlawful. Do you agree that it was unlawful? Um, the, this is a matter for uh, the, uh, the Foreign Minister. Today again, Lou tried to tidy up in a statement, whether it was written by her or someone higher up, she admitted that China was not a democracy and all countries with claims to the South China Sea, again, she didn't mention China, should respect international law. Now, Professor Clive Hamilton has warned for some time about the Chinese regime's influence in Australia, particularly his excellent book, A Silent Invasion, China's Influence in Australia. And Professor Clive Hamilton joins me now. Uh, Clive, what was the most uh, significant thing about what Gladys Liu said, either last night or today? Well, I think the most significant thing from la the astonishing interview last night, it reminded me of the Sam Dastiari one, which, uh, in which he came unstuck because he couldn't answer questions about where he got the money from, uh, from the Chinese donors. But the most significant thing was not so much what she uh, said, but what she didn't say or couldn't say. It was the extraordinary evasiveness and the denials that she uh, engaged in. And so I think this really goes to the, the core of the problem with all of this, and that is the secrecy about it all. I mean, look, if uh, an Italian-Australian runs for office and uh, she's a member of the Italian Communist Party, Fine, perfectly entitled to do so, but the voters should know that. And it's the, it's the concealment of these uh, associations 
with organisations that are linked uh, to the Chinese Communist Party, or in two cases, once you've mentioned, there actually are part of the Communist Party's influence structure, that really goes to the heart of it because it speaks to the way in which the Chinese Communist Party itself is attempting to influence Australia in a covert uh, and corrupt way. Well, uh, let's tease that out. What is exactly the problem with her association with uh, these groups, particularly the two that she last night denied at first, falsely, uh, having been a member of mm. or having any memory of being a member of, uh, she, I mean, after all, she does say she puts Australia first. So what's the problem with being with these two groups? Well, these uh, groups are part of the Communist Party's uh, so-called United Front Work Department structure of uh, organisations whose specific purpose is to engage in covert political influence in countries like Australia. And they do this uh, in part, in large part, uh, through the Chinese diaspora. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely kind of secretive, a very effective and sophisticated mode of influencing politics and, uh, and politicians in other countries. And it's the hidden nature of it, the secretive nature of it, that's really disturbing. And it's particularly disturbing because the organisation in question, the Chinese Communist Party, which is using the democratic process in a country like Australia to gain political influence, uh, to exercise effectively control over Australia if it can get that far. This organisation is one that explicitly rejects Western democracy. It's an organisation that explicitly rejects Western human rights as uh, things that don't apply to, to China and Chinese people. So there's this fundamental... Uh, uh, a devious contradiction in the way that the party operates. It will exploit everything it can, free press, free elections, free speech, the legal system in Australia in order to advance its interests, and yet none of those apply uh, in uh, China, and it actively repudiates those as values and structures that should be adopted. Now, uh, Clive, I got some criticism for... Um uh, saying to her that I found it extraordinary, because I gave her about three or four opportunities, to say that uh, China's president, Xi Jinping, was a dictator. And I've been told, well, look, no politician will say that. Now, I tried it on two other politicians last night from the Liberal and Labor Party. None of them, neither of them would say he was a dictator, although they did say, well, he's not freely elected or he is the leader of an authoritarian movement or something. Should I read too much into the fact, not only would she not call him a dictator, which seems to be a common weakness of our politicians, but she wouldn't criticise him in any way? Is that just politics as usual? Um, well, uh, it, it is a lamentable fact about uh, uh, Australian politics in recent years that uh, political leaders on both sides have uh, tiptoed around uh, the uh, Chinese Communist Party, even when it engages in egregious uh, acts. Uh, but we do have seen uh, some political leaders in recent times stand up. Malcolm Tam Turnbull, of course, is the standout case. Um, and he introduced some very serious and significant measures to try and push back against CCP influence. Um, uh, the current foreign minister also made a, quite a strong statement the other day about the kind of practices that Beijing has been engaged in. But as a general rule, Australian politicians are extremely reluctant to stand up and speak out. I should, of course, mention Andrew Hastie. So it is yes. possible to make strong statements uh, critical of the Chinese Communist Party. And as long as we in Western democracies refuse to, because we're too frightened of the consequences, then Beijing will continue to bully and it, it must be stopped. There must be a red line, uh, you know, this far and no more. Ah, yes, well, let's not uh, get too naive here, I'm afraid. Uh, Clive, uh, I'm going to talk after the break with James Campbell about the political fallout from this and the latest news about the ASIO investigation. But for now, I want to raise, uh, just before we go, one other issue with you, uh, but it is related. Uh, we have many New Zealand viewers of this show as well, and they've just found out how incredibly weak, and you've just spoken about this, uh, their own politicians are as well in standing up to this dictatorship. Their opposition leader, leader of the Nationals, Simon Bridges, has just been on a trip to China. He took with him, this is incredible, uh, the Nationals MP uh, Zhang Yang, 
who in China used to teach Chinese spies. Mm. And Bridges, on his mm. visit, met the head of China's spy agencies and secret police. And to top it off, he gave an interview on Chinese television praising the Communist Party of China, the CPC, for all it had done for the country it's made richer, but which it also has turned into a tyranny. Listen to this. And as I say, that transformation has been so dramatic. We have felt the privilege of being able to have many firsts with your party uh, and with your country. These things have been very good between our countries and, of course, have been driven uh, by the CPC. Clive, that kind of crawling to the Communist Party, how significant is that? Well, I mean, of course, uh, I'm sure many Kiwis watched that kind of sycophancy and, A, were sickened by it, and, and B, thought, well, if this is our alternative government, what are we really getting into? If this man is so close, or so willing to pay obeisance to the emperor uh, when he goes to Beijing. But what we need to think about here is how that plays in China. You see, many uh, global leaders go to uh, Beijing and they engage in this kind of kowtowing uh, to the Chinese Communist Party, and, and particularly Xi Jinping, if they're gifted uh, with an audience with him. You'll notice, incidentally, that when that happens, Xi will always stop and stand and wait for the other leader, no matter how important he or she is, to come to him. And there's great significance of that in China, because that's you know, televised all over China. And what it does is it legitimises the role of the Chinese Communist Party as the ruling party of China. And those images send a very strong message uh, on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party to Chinese people, look, look at us. We are the rulers of China and all of the leaders in the rest of the world come to us and they bow down before us. And so you must support us. We are legitimate. And I think uh, foreign leaders overlook that extremely important uh, political function that they, uh, in trying to be super polite, uh, actually engage in. It's, it's very regrettable that they get sucked in that way. Well, I think particularly, Clive, that those pictures are watched by people who are risking their lives in China or have relatives who have risked theirs and are in jail fighting for democracy and more freedom. And they sit there and they watch a Western leader crawl, crawl to a Chinese regime that is oppressing them and their heart must just go through their boots to see that. I just, uh, I just think it's Ab terrible. Clive Hamilton, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, Ch uh, Chinese uh, New Zealanders must be very dismayed about that because that sends a message that they are New Zealand citizens and they cannot be sure that they will be protected from the Chinese Communist Party in their new home. Correct. Clive Hamilton, once again, I have to thank you for your time.